special event of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Vice Chair of the Center. My name is Emily Gottrich. I'm delighted to be here to introduce our speaker today. Menachem Klein is a professor of political science at Bar Ilan University in Israel and a longtime participant in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. He received his PhD in Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies from Hebrew University in 1992, and since the 1990s has been deeply involved in both official and unofficial negotiations with Israel's, with, uh, Israel's Palestinian counterparts. He has served as an advisor on Jerusalem affairs and Israel PLO status talks to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and also as a member of the advisory team of Prime Minister Ehud Barak. In 2003, together with other prominent Israeli and Palestinian negotiators, Menachem signed the Geneva Agreement, a detailed proposal for comprehensive Israeli-Palestinian peace accord. He's currently a senior fellow at the Bruno Krisky, Krisky Fund for International Forum for International Dialogue in Vienna, and, is a, and formerly served as a board member of the influential organization Betselem. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Betselem, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. Menachem's academic research focuses on the history of the Middle East, the Palestinian national movement, and the peace process. He's the author of too many works for me to mention here, but I will just cite Jerusalem, the Contested City, which was published by New York University Press in 2001, and The Shift, Israel-Palestine from Border Struggle to Ethnic Conflict, published by Columbia University Press in 2010. His most recent book, Lives in Common, Arabs and Jews in Jerusalem, Jaffa and Hebron, will be published by Hearst in June, and it is about that work that we will be hearing more today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Menachem Klein to the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you the, the book, just the, the uh, web page of my uh, London publisher. Uh, it will, uh, it will be, uh, be out on, in, on, in June. And here in the States, uh, in December, by Oxford University Press. So uh, my English publisher is prevented by Oxford from any promotion here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, the, the maximum I, I could Google only to Amazon UK because you cannot find it in Amazon, Amazon, Amazon here, United States. You can find the book only uh, in uh, Amazon UK and until uh, Oxford put it in the catalog later this year. So uh, endorsements or here you can read a uh, few endorsement, uh, endorsements. Uh, the last one was by Salim Tamari, uh, mm -hmm. the third one, uh, which I highly appreciate as the one of the best uh, sociologists of uh, Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to tell you about, uh, about this book and what makes it, for me at least, very unique. Um, I decided to write a different book than all, all other books that uh, I wrote and perhaps I read, uh, also I read, about uh, <coughs> Israel-Palestine. I am a Jerusalemite first. I live in Jerusalem, I'm uh, born in Jerusalem, but about 50 years already I live in Jerusalem. Um, I live in the city, I have some opinions about the city, I have life experience in the city, and I study the city. Uh, but up to this book, I always wrote about organizations, states, <coughs> institutions, not about the average resident and the citizen of the city. And then I came to acknowledge that what is needed is history from below. History from below of the average citizen uh, it is lacking. Salim Tamari published very important books uh, on a some few chapters. But there is no comprehensive, uh, comprehensive study of uh, the interaction between Jews and Arabs in Palestine 
Uh, what we have is the history of wars, history of conflict, history of national movements, history of struggle Israel-Palestine, or sociology of Palestine, Pal the Palestinian national movement, or the Palestinian cities, uh, and sociology of Israeli Jews, or Israeli Palestinians. But there is no history of the interaction between the average citizens of a certain place. And history that covers uh, 150 years. So I decided to write such a book and to compare three cities in the center of the country, center Palestine. Uh, three cities, Jaffa, coast city, and two holy cities on the hills, Jerusalem and Hebron. The three cities in maintain contacts and open roads between them since the late since the late 19th century. <clears throat> so they are not disconnected. They are connected, but they are very different. Uh, very different. Short distance, you can find very different cities, very different communities, very different history of each uh, urban uh, community. As I said, one coast city, two holy cities. The two holy cities are uh, holy for both Jews and Muslims. The holiest cities of Palestine are Jerusalem and Hebron. Uh, so they are important for Jews and, uh, and, and Muslims. Interact. People move. Ideas move between the cities, and each of them has different type of relations, or each community uh, has different type of relations between Jews and Arabs. The, uh, also, the, uh, the, uh, the big Jewish city next to the Palestinian one is different. So let's say West Jerusalem, relates to East Jerusalem in a very different way that Tel Aviv relates to Jaffa or the settlement Kirat Arba relates to Hebron, uh, the Arab city of Hebron. So there is much in this subject. I decided to also to begin earlier than the national struggle. It was an in-purpose decision that I, I took. I, would, I, 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 I wanted to bring the reader to see what happened, what was there on the ground when the, when the national movements came in. What was there before? I debate, I disagree, I beg to differ with those who start history with the conflict. The history of modern Palestine starts prior to the conflict. Historians debate when exactly the conflict between uh, the two national movements began. The, the first wave of immigrants, the Aliyah, the Jewish <coughs> immigrants, or the second wave, or uh, the riots 1920, 19, or 29, or 36, the Arab, the Arab revolt, the Palestinian revolt, or 48. But OK, fine, but what happened there before? And what, in, in particular, what was the impact of the, the small conflicts on everyday life? I'm interested in everyday life. Everyday life. What, what happens? How Jews and Arabs interact in uh, shops, in the bazaar, in schools, uh, mixed marriage, neighborhood. These are everyday life issues that I, I, I check. I found very rich, let's say, library. Or, um, of memoirs, mostly written, published, written and published by, by Jews. I based my research on archives, 
uh, Israeli State Archive, Jerusalem Municipality, Tel Aviv Municipality, uh, and few Palestinian memoirs. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the, most of the Palestinians did not publish private papers. Uh, they, okay, they lost the war. We Jews, Israeli Jews, we are the winners, and the winners enjoy the the the, uh, the option to publish and to establish national archives, and municipal archives, and so on. So not not so much is published by Palestinians, but what was published, especially Salim Namari contributed much to our knowledge, uh, is. Uh, is very important. Recently published, uh, uh, translated to, to English, a, a wide selection of two volumes of uh, Wasif Jawariya, uh, private paper memoirs, uh, Storyteller of Jerusalem, which is fascinating the person, and uh, 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 50 years, he covers 50 years of, of life uh, since uh, have being a young young boy in uh, Jerusalem at the uh, late Ottoman period and during the British uh, mandate. Very important, uh, very important uh, work. And there are other memoirs published by, by uh, uh, Palestinians on, uh, on this period that I use. So uh, what I found uh, is a, a, a fascinating reality, but perhaps unknown reality at the end of 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, first, unlike the common wisdom, Jeru the, we re the Jerusalem was not divided according to Muslim quarter, Jewish quarter, Christian quarter, etc., and Armenian quarter. There were no, let's say, conventional quarters. This is a British enterprise, a bit British concept, but in reality there, 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 there was no exclusive Jewish or Muslim quarter. Jews lived in the Muslim quarter, many of them. And Muslims, were, uh, they, they lived few Muslims in the Jewish quarter. So there was, there was no exclusive quarter, exclusive religiously or uh, a national a quarter in Jerusalem. Second, uh, unlike the Zionist, uh, let's say, myth, I would say, it has no roots in history. Unlike the Zionist myth that the Zionist brought westernization and modernization to Palestine and Jerusalem, that the, the Arabs were under the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Empire were, let's say, Orientalist of the people of the past, and the Jews came, brought modernity, introduced mo modernity into Palestine. And they went out of the walls and built New Jerusalem. This is the, the concept of many Israeli Jewish uh, historians. The most let's say, prominent them, the most famous one is Yoshua ben Arie, for example, the Hebrew University. But unfortunately, history tells something different. Both Jews and Arabs left the walls and introduced westernization and modernization to, uh, to, to Palestine. Uh, the, the, and Jews lived in the new Palestinian Arab neighborhoods in Sheikh Jarrah, for example. Uh, so the Jews and Arabs at the late Ottoman period and also along the British Mandate period lived together uh, in a way that is substantially different than the cohabitation of the medievals, of the Golden Age. The, uh, the, in the Golden Age, the Vimmi rules my Roma was the format that uh, shaped the relations between Jews and uh, uh, Jews and Muslims, and the identity of each group 
was a general identity of Muslims and Jews, not related to the place or to the community or to the neighborhood. This, but this type of relation does not exist anymore in the late 19th century, early 20th century. At that time, local identity emerged in Palestine of a, let's say, Palestinian identity that Jews are part of. Anyone who reads memoirs of, of, of Jews uh, find out, and some Palestinians find out immediately that they formed up a, a kind of a local identity based on everyday life, not ideology, not on poets or visionaries or whatever, like, you know, perhaps like uh, the visionaries of the Arab nationalism or the father founders of, of Zionism. But they lived together and created, established an imagined community of local people and local identity. Jews participated both in Jerusalem and Hebron, in Nabi Musa festival, for example. I, I even quote that according to few of these people of Jerusalemites, when they saw the, the, the people of Hebron coming from Hebron to Jerusalem, to the Nabi Musa festival, they gathered in Al-Aqsa, those who came from Hebron in the south, and those who came from Labus in the, in the north, and then together they went to, to the east, eastwards, towards Jericho, to uh, Makam de Musa, uh, where according to the local tradition, this is the, uh, the place where Moses is buried. Uh, Jews perceived the people, the Arabs, the Muslims, coming from Hebron as their forefathers that remain there after the, uh, the uh, revolt of the Second Temple and, uh, and became Muslims uh, later with the, uh, the uh, Arab and Muhammad and the Umar army coming in the 7th century and uh, 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 conquering Palestine. So it was not only a way of observing a festival of the other, but it was a festival, our festival. The same, the same, uh, uh, the same implies also to Jaffa, local festival of Nebi Rubin, uh, Prophet Ruben, Nebi Rubin, which was the local festival of, of, of uh, the Jaffa people, that Jews came. Jews came from, from elsewhere, nearby Nebi Rubin, south, <coughs> south to tell today Tel Aviv, near Ashdod, and uh, they visited. They visited the place. It was, and uh, Nebi Musa was, uh, lasted one week. Nebi Rubin, the whole month, mm -hmm. July, August. It was a kind of summer camp and summer festival for the people of Jaffa. And Jews participated in religious festivals, which was, in, in the case of Nebi Rubin, not mm -hmm. so religious. It was music, several belly dancers, Gambling, and it was it's very interesting uh, type of, of summer festival. Uh, the the, the Nabi Musa was more religious, of course. This is the difference between the secular coast city of Jaffa and the hilltop religious cities of Hebron and, and Jerusalem. But what was what 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 is very very, what is very impressive is that after each conflict, let's say 1919, 20, 29, 36, when the violence ends, life comes back. 
as nothing happened. So we cannot say that there is a point zero where the two communities were totally divided. It did not happen, in my account, overnight. There was no one event that divided, split Jews from Arabs. Gradually, it happened gradually, but in particular between 45 to 48 after World War II. But to get, I, I was surprised to find in Tel Aviv municipality archives that after the half year of violence in 36, the first stage of the Arab revolt, the Palestinian revolt, and the many attacks, Jews on Arabs, it was a kind of a civil war, community war. So when, when the violence ended, Arabs came in big numbers to Tel Aviv, Jews returned in big numbers for everyday life concerns to Jaffa. At the eve of 48 war, Jaffa, the main city in Palestine, much more important than Haifa, uh, seven, uh, cohabitated 70,000 people. Uh, up to April 48, when, when the Palestinians uh, fled and ran away and abandoned Jaffa, which in the Palestinian memory is the abandoned city. And they are ashamed of, of this. And therefore, there is no history of Jaffa. But it's, it's now uh, an Israeli Arab, Israeli Palestinian historian works to write the history of Jaffa. But the, it takes more than 60 years to write down um, the history of the city. It's not easy for the Palestinians to admit that they, uh, they ran away, escaped, and abandoned the city. But Jews came back to, to Jaffa, and Palestinians came back to Tel Aviv. Uh, out of the 10,000 out of 70,000 people were Jews, 5,000 living on the suburbs of Jaffa, 5,000 were in, within the old city, living in Jaffa in the old city. In Jerusalem, few Jews lived in Sheikh Jarrah area, or in Wadi Joz, or a Muslim a, a, much more in the Muslim quarter, in the Armenian quarter, in the Christian quarter few. But in South Jerusalem, Southwest Jerusalem, in the Katamont and Bia Baka, 22,000 Palestinians reside at the eve of 48 war. And 500 Jews inside, among 22,000 Palestinians. So the war in 48 created a division uh, between the, the two communities that for many years interacted on, on a, a everyday life. And mixed marriage was a very common phenomenon of, of Jew, Jews and, 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 and Arabs, Jews and Arabs. What I also found is that not only Oriental Jews, the Mizrahi Jews, uh, interacted with Arabs, but many Ashkenazi Jews. Also many Ashkenazi Jews, on everyday life. It was, it was a, a, a matter of, of, of life. Uh, not Zionist. Here, I, I, I would like to, to, to differ between the Zionist and the indigenous people. Okay, which included also Jews. So um, the Rashid Khalidi uh, conclusion in his very famous book, very good book, Palestinian Identity, he excludes the Jews from Palestinian identity. And I must, unfortunately, I must say, history shows this. History, history shows that the Jews were part of local Palestinian local identity. 
And we have to take into account that both Zionism and Arab nationalism came to Palestine from outside. Arab nationalism came from uh, uh, Medina with the great Arab revolt of Sharif Hussein, with Faisal administration in the Damascus. Zionism came from Europe with the British, with the help of the British. We very soon will celebrate, commemorate the 100 years of Balfour Declaration. But Zionism came from outside. But when Zionism and Arabism came from outside to Palestine, already there was there some kind of a local identity of the country, of, the, of, of people living in this place, and a, a sense and imagination of a community greater than the religious affinity, the religious attachment, or the exact place where I was born. Something about the land, the country. And Jerusalem was, Jaffa as well, kind of a cosmopolitan city. See, at the end of, at the end of uh, 19th century, about 20,000 visitors entered to Jaffa and Jerusalem <coughs> annually. Which include pilgrimage, poor people from from Russia or Greece coming to pray in Jerusalem to visit the holy sites, but also the grand tour of the, to, of the Orient by, by Westerners. Ships were modern, steamships. Steamships cross the Mediterranean less time than previously, and brought ma more, many more people. Uh, I found in the Jerusalem Municipality Archive a survey uh, about the childhood uh, of uh, Jerusalemites during the British Mandate, late Ottoman period, uh, early uh, the 20s, uh, 30s. And uh, there were 60 people in the Israeli Jews um, in the survey, most of them knew more than two languages. The languages that you heard here, heard in the streets, were not only uh, uh, Arabic and Hebrew, French, Italian, English, and people knew it and, uh, and, and spoke these languages. So in a way, Jerusalem was a, a, a Jaffa, uh, both of them were kind of a cosmopolitan a, a cities of the, of the Middle East. I cannot say, I, don't, I, I think, I assume that this was not the case, for example, in Baghdad. Baghdad did not attract so many tourists from the West. Cairo, perhaps, Alexandria, perhaps, but Beirut also, but not Baghdad, for example. So uh, uh, Palestine uh, was uh, in a kind of very uh, unique phenomena. And I, I can say that Arab Jews in Palestine are very different than the Arab Jews of Baghdad or uh, Egypt or even uh, Beirut. Because in Jerusalem, they, uh, since the 70, 1870s, the, the Jews are the majority community in the city. Uh, and they, many of them are Arab Jews, what we call Arab, Arab Jews, meaning that they uh, exercise Arab culture, they are part of the, the Arab culture, and they have local identity interacting with, uh, with, uh, the, 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 with Arabs. The Zionists are different. The Zionists, come, the Zionists came from outside, and the Zionist aim was to turn themselves from immigrants to natives on the account of the natives, which include also Jews, I must say. So uh, here I, 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 I beg to change the perception regarding uh, uh, Zionism. And as I said, I also uh, disagree with the conclusion that only the Zionists modernized Palestine. No, it was, uh, it was a project done both by Palestinian Jews and uh, and, and Arabs. 
Then uh, I, uh, the second half of the book deals with post-48 and post-67. And unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the two wars, which I see them as one war, uh, with, let's say, uh, kind of 19 years divided between two parts of the same war, uh, the uh, 48 changed everything substantially. There is no way, if I, I, many people ask me, is there any way to go back to the relations prevail then? My answer is no. Unfortunately, no. The, the, in, a, in a way, it's a, it's, a, it's a tragedy. In a way, I, I do think that this is a tragedy. The, the victory that the State of Israel achieved twice in 48 and, and 67 uh, shaped a different type of relations between Jews and Arabs. Up to 48, it was more or less egalitarian. The Zionists came from outside, they took over, but when the Zionist victory prevailed and happened, then hierarchical relations established. The Jews up, the Arabs, Palestinians behind them. And Jews tried to rewrite, or succeed, in many cases succeeded, to rewrite the history. I, I deal with many details how the Jews shape or change the street names in Jaffa and in Jerusalem. How they try to recreate an environment that reflects the Jewish identity, the Zionist Israeli identity, on the account of the local indigenous people. The, uh, also, what Israel lives in a denial, and Israel denies the existence of the Palestinians there in these local neighborhoods. Uh, sometimes, and I have a very long chapter on refugees visiting their previous homes and meeting the present, the current housekeeper or, house, or the re resident or the owner of, of the place. And they, and what happens when they began speaking? Or when the refugee knock on the door and ask to enter and visit? Not to, to, to return, not to de 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 deport the, the Israeli Jew, or in certain cases, there are Jews coming to visit their uh, previous home in uh, the old city of Jerusalem and Hebron. Very few cases, but um, most cases are uh, houses owned once by Palestinian and now uh, by, 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 by Jews. The, 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 the interaction then is very tense, very emotional, very different than what was before, prior to 48. But there is no one rule along which the interaction goes after 40, 67. In certain cases, the Israeli owner does not let the Palestinian to enter. In other cases, enter only to the living room, but not, <laughs> not allowed to see the whole apartment. And very interesting in dialogue happens between, between them. Why I don't let you enter? And so in, certain, in other cases, come in, come in. Come in and see and visit. Uh, What's the problem? Okay, it's very nice. And there are moments also, the first, of denial. <clears throat> you never lived here. Impossible. I bought it from. So, uh, the, uh, the, the different <coughs> levels of uh, a, a denial and then acceptance and letting the, uh, acknowledging that once this was uh, owned by another family, another nationality, 
is there. And what is also interesting is that there, there are differences be, between human beings and institution vis-a-vis -vis human beings. So the Israeli institutions relate to the Palestinians in very hierarchical way. We are the rulers and we impose on you A, B, C, and D. But when human beings meet, when a dialogue between human beings begin, then it is different. It's not ideal. The, the situation of, the new situation of 48 still is there. But then something, when people meet, create different interaction than between institution and uh, an occupied person. Or, uh, and this also exists after 4867. Uh, I will give you a few, few examples. Jaffa first. After 48, most of the Jaffa residents left, but the few that remained were taken in to Ajami neighborhood in Jaffa, put in a concentration area with, uh, with soldiers all around under military rule. And uh, when Jaffa was uh, annexed to Tel Aviv, the, uh, the military rule dissolved. And then new immigrants from Iraq, uh, Bulgaria, Romania came, uh, were brought by the Israeli authorities to settle uh, into Jaffa and occupy the abandoned houses, the pal abandoned Palestinian houses. Now, the memoirs of both Palestinians and Israeli Jews on these years of, of living together in the poor Jaffa of the 50s and 60s, uh, the, the, the stories are the same. They live together very, very happy and very closely and very friendly. The interaction between the, the people there was between human beings. So the, the Israeli authorities related very badly to the Palestinians. Uh, but uh, on the human level, it was very different. Also, uh, let's, let's, let's take Hebron, for example. The first 20, the first, no, 10 years of the Israeli settlement in Kiryat Arba, near Hebron, uh, between 67 and 77, were, are very, very different than what happens later. <coughs> Uh, settlers were, uh, there was an Israeli bank in downtown Hebron, uh, also post office, Israeli post office there. Settlers used to go to the bazaar and they uh, shot there and wrote his checks to the Palestinian shopkeeper with the Hebrew uh, dates, in Hebrew with Hebrew dates. And the checks were accepted. There were very close relations. <coughs> a, a, a famous person, very extremist, ultra-nationalist person, settler, one of the father founders of Kiryat Arba, is a lawyer. And he uh, presented in the Israeli courts Clients from our Palestinian clients from Hebron, for example. Everything then changed when the, the, the Israelis began settling downtown Hebron in the Kasbah, inside, and, and uh, this <coughs> creates the life there in hell. What, all what we know about racism, aggression. 
expansion uh, on Hebron is terrible. And, but this was not there from the, from the beginning. Also in Jerusalem, the same line between Jewish and Arab neighborhoods, the first 20 years up to the, the 87 Intifada were very, very different. Very, very, very different. Um, the interaction between people was something that today is hard to imagine even, of Jews and Arabs spending much time together near Nablus Gate, uh, in coffee shops, interaction and, uh, together, uh, um, close relations between uh, uh, Jews and Arabs spending good time together in Jericho, in restaurants, uh, joint adventures, uh, for example, up to 67, uh, sea fruits were not allowed in Jerusalem. You could not find any restaurant with sea seafood. Immediately after the war, uh, a fisherman, fisher, a fisherman family decided to open a partnership with a Palestinian family, a restaurant of seafood in East Jerusalem, open in Shabbat. <laughs> really, it was the first restaurant in Jerusalem where Jerusalemites could eat seafood. Then came the first intifada, it closed down. Uh, in the first years uh, of the Israeli occupation, a Palestinian uh, hotel published ad ads in the Israeli Hebrew newspaper promoting the hotel for the Jewish New Year festival in Hebrew, in Maori, for example. Come and celebrate in our hotel, Shepherd's Hotel. This kind, it doesn't exist anymore. This that doesn't exist. Even religious festivals, okay, I will, it, 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 it tells much about, for example, Sheikh Jarrah. Sheikh Jarrah uh, is a place where, according to the, uh, the Jewish tradition, is the, uh, the cave of Simon the Saint. Shimon Tzadik, Simon the Saint. Shimon Tzadik uh, is a very local holy place. I mean local means that up to, up to 67, it, Simon was holy for both Jews, Muslims, and Christians. And the documents describing the uh, celebration of, the, of, of Simon uh, the saint, they, they speak about Jews, Arabs, Christians, Muslims, even slaves, black slaves, <coughs> participating in the celebration. To all together, because it is a local. It is the saint of the locals of Jerusalemites. All Jerusalemites. As Jews participated in Nabi Musa, for instance. But then, after 67, Israel took it over. It's an exclusive Jewish place. And today, settlers enter into Sheikh Jarrah. They rename the place from Sheikh Jarrah to Simon the Saint Shimon at Sadiq neighborhood. And it's exclusive Jewish, exclusive Jewish holy place. The same happens also in Nabi Samuel, Prophet Samuel, north to Jerusalem, which was also a local holy site for both Jews and Muslims. Today, hardly Muslims can get there because of the Israeli security, uh, the separation fence. Um, that prevents the, uh, the local Palestinians, most of them, to enter. Um, and, and you can find there uh, a, a yeshiva, a Jewish uh, studies college, there that took over the, 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 the place. So these uh, are examples of establishment, residence relations, but, and uh, a, and it uh, uh, escalates since 87. And definitely when settlers enter, 
uh, into the Palestinian neighborhoods, it, it is even worse. Also, what we can see in Jerusalem recently uh, is uh, that there is a, de a, a denial of the Arab, uh, Arab, let's say, Arab identity of certain areas. In my neighborhood in South Jerusalem, uh, the municipality named the area or institutions uh, in three languages, Hebrew, Arabic, and uh, English. But constantly, uh, the individuals color with black color the Arab names. Refuse to acknowledge that this is Talbiye, Dhaka, and, 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 and so on. Uh, it is a fight over identity and over history. Uh, and there is a, 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 there is a denial uh, in the Israeli society uh, of the uh, previous uh, belonging or identity of, uh, uh, of the place. Um, uh, you cannot find, let's say, for example, there is a, a very nice enterprise by both Tel Aviv municipality and Jerusalem municipality. Most probably it was taken from here, from the United States. Once a year, private homes are open, open to visitors. Uh, house from within is called, if I translate. And uh, each year, the municipality, the Jerusalem municipality, publish a, a booklet of the houses and the short history of the house. And it's very interesting to see that the Palestinian identity is is not there. You can find, let's say, house, Arab house, Arab house. That's it. <laughs> or house built on the third in the thirties. Who was living there? Nobody. Today, the family X lives there and change it and so reconstruct it and in this way and that way. But that's it. The, the Palestinians are deleted from the men, from from the public <coughs> sphere. They are not acknowledged at all in registration. In few cases. Tel Aviv a little, slightly different in Jaffa, slightly. But always in Jaffa, in Jerusalem they don't exist, in South Jerusalem. The, in East Jerusalem they don't, they don't uh, cooperate with the municipality, so there are no Palestinian homes open for Israeli visitors or for them. They just participate, they boycott the enterprise. Uh, except hotels and public institutions. In Jaffa, is Tel Aviv is more liberal in a way, and Tel Aviv municipality describe not the belong the previous belonging so much as the westernization and the development. This house was built by X, and it was developed, reconstructed, and so on. So you, it goes along the Zionist myth that we came here. And we developed the country, and because we developed the country, we now have the right to own it. Very colonial, typical colonial concept. Very typical colonial concept. But still, here and there you can find in, in, in the Tel Aviv municipality booklets of the project houses from within, some acknowledgement that this and that house was owned by uh, uh, by, by, by the Palestinian family, Tel Aviv is a slightly more liberal than, than Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem, uh, the situation is, is very, very bad. So in the second uh, part of my book, I confront between past and present. I, 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 will, I show how the, the past is Re reflected in the present and how the present struggles with the past and how the, the, the past and, and, and present are so, so so different and the direction changes. This is, um, I must say, um, it, it was for me a long journey. It took me five years to write the book, to call it, 
more. Uh, I, uh, to to uh, collect the materials and to write a narrative uh, and to bring the voice of the average citizen. Unlike uh, other pieces of scholarship in which there is an you know, introduction and theory, etc., etc., I decided to, to write a narrative and to bring the voices of the people themselves, how they describe their lives and their feelings and emotions, uh, and let them speak and tell their, their story. It was uh, hard to write it. It's not easy. To, it's much easier to write a scholarship than <laughs> to write a, a, a narrative. So, so, so you know, there is a, the type, you go along the pattern, and that's it. You end it within, within a year, that's it. But to write a narrative that attracts the reader and, and brings the reader to, to a trip in the streets, in the streets of, of the place, and, and, and meet the people <coughs> living there, is something, something different. I hope that I, uh, I succeeded. It is, it, as far as I know, the first book that brings the voices of the average citizen history from below. The, uh, the, the method of, of uh, writing history from below is, is very well developed in, in, in European history, very well. But in Middle East history, it is, it, it is lacking. Um, Middle East history, I mean Israel Palestine. There are a few books on, on Egypt on this way, Egypt during the Second World War, well, very good works, actually, very good works. But Israel Palestine, this, uh, this is lacking. And I, I try to, uh, uh, to uh, contribute to open the space. And I, I always tell the students, and here I see students, don't forget that history is done by individual people. Look for the individual people. Don't think on theories. Don't think on institutions. Look for the individual people. They are the real actors of history. Look what, how they be, what they do, how they interact, how they behave, and so on. And, and don't forget. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>